Again, um, just to officially note when it's recording, I gave you back your test there. Um, the high score was 94 or 95, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, the low score this time was 65, much better than last time around. Um, and of course, if you have questions, feel free to come talk to me about them. I'm going to very quickly go over a couple slides from the last lecture on Lorentz transforms just because you know I had like the matrix in the wrong order um, and then we'll move on so we started by saying we're looking for a an invariant something that if we make this measurement it's going to be the same in all reference frames and I put your tester where you usually say and what we found for space time was that ct quantity squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared is going to be the same in all reference frames because light is going to emanate outward in all directions with the same speed c in all reference frames. So that's where we got that four vector invariant. And I just introduced, we never use that, but if you're going to do stuff in, in relativity, you kind of need to know how to multiply these four vectors. So I showed the method of multiplying the four vectors. And of course, just like with normal three space vectors, when you multiply, you either have the option of a dot product or a cross product. And the one we're using here is the scalar product, the dot product. So because we had a linear transformation, that is that the time in one reference frame is linearly proportional to the time in another reference frame. And the length in one reference frame is linear proportional to the length in another reference frame. It makes perfect sense that we should be able to make a transformation of the position and time of an event that's just linearly proportional to distance and time. And so we set forth to do it. You'll notice I've changed now my matrix, so it's correct. I'm, I'm very thankful that you noticed that. And so we just went through, and I'm not gonna repeat it. I kept the slides here just so we have the, the process of using the length contraction and time dilation equations to get an equation that relates the position and time. So we have these equations here for how the time for an event and the position for an event change in one reference frame compared to another. And so what that is saying is if you have an event that occurs at position X at time T, then in a different reference frame that's moving at speed V relative to that, it will occur at t prime as calculated there and x prime as calculated there. Now, why does that only have x? Why not x, y, and z? Since we really need three coordinates to identify any location. The other two won't change. So I didn't worry about making a specific equation for them because there's no difference. Because the length contraction was only in the direction parallel to motion. And so we just defined that V direction is x hat. So that was that was a definition for our direction. And so here I wrote the matrix transformation using those two equations above. And then I rewrote it. The only difference between the upper, the one that's now in a red, uh, blue box and the one below that's not, is that I used CT and ct prime instead of t and t prime. But by doing that, you see that this matrix becomes much prettier, really, because now it's a symmetric matrix. And so we can use matrices for transformations. And of course, if it was a three dimension, or if it was the full matrix, we would have one minus, and I'm gonna use beta, beta defined as V over C. This would be the matrix for transforming all four variables. But you notice the last, <laughs> the last two, the Y and Z, were trivials, right? It's just the one one there. And I believe I have all my signs correct in this because, you know, it's a bugaboo. So this is the summary then of our transformations. We have the X and the X prime frame 
I only work through how you derive the transformation from the unprimed frame into the primed frame. But then I said, what's the difference in the prime and the unprimed? They're both correct. One of our fundamental understandings of relativity is there is no experiment you can do that identifies a stationary reference frame versus one moving at a constant velocity. So that means that if I'm going to change from the prime to the unprimed, all I really have to do is change the direction of the velocity. I use an example, I don't remember who it was, but if, you know, let's, let's say Aaron, if Aaron's coming at me, I'd say, oh, she has a velocity in this direction. And if Aaron is the one making the measurement, she would say, no, Richard has a velocity in that direction. But we agree on what the velocity is, so the only difference is changing the sign of velocity, which you see there for the unprimed, it's only changed the sign for the velocity term beta. Remember, beta is just a unitless velocity. It's the velocity divided by the speed of light in vacuum. Well, we are going to use these now to calculate how velocity adds, addition of velocity. Now, we've seen the result for velocity in the same direction. Now we're going to look at, well, how that is derived and what happens if you have vol velocities perpendicular. So here is our situation to start out with. We have some object. In this picture, it's the red ball. And the red ball is moving at speed u sub x in our unprimed frame and speed u sub x prime in the primed reference frame. Makes enough sense, right? What we want to do is to relate those two values. Why are we using the term u? Well, because we want to distinguish it from v, the speed of one reference frame with respect to the other. So u is going to be the speed of our object. V is the speed of the reference frame. Now, the derivatives are still the same because the, all physics has to be the same. And the definition of speed is the derivative of position with respect to time. So I have ux prime is equal to dx prime over dt prime. No shock there. Now comes the part that takes creativity. Calculating dx prime divided by dt prime. What I am going to do is start by separating and just saying, well, what is dx prime? And so if you look at my equation for x here, or x prime, you guys have, by now, I believe, you've learned in your calculus class that dx prime is going to be d of, you know, we, we go through, we just take the derivative without having it with respect to something all the way through. And so I can go through this. Because v and gamma are constant, then doing my derivatives, gamma and v are just constants. And I'm just going to have gamma times dx minus v dt. Not shocking, was it? Now let's do the same thing for time. dt prime is equal to gamma dt plus v over c squared. That's not a plus sign. It's a minus sign. dx. Now, if you just take the ratio of those two, say dx prime dt prime is equal to the top one over the bottom one, you find yourself with a non-lovely situation. But we have an easier way of doing this. What we're going to do is say, well, let's take dx prime dt and divide the whole shoot and match by dt prime dt. Now, of course, derivatives are not truly fractions, but yet we always treat them like that. And so it's totally legitimate to say that taking that upper one, dx prime dt, and divide by the lower one, dt prime dt, will give me my ux prime, 
which I should have written out here, which is dx prime dt. Now, when I substitute this in, it's not difficult. So let me give myself some space. Okay, the gamma is still there. dx dt minus v dt dt. What did we call dx dt here? U of x minus v, and what's dt dt? It's always just one. So there's my numerator, gamma u of x minus v, and then my denominator is going to be, well, I'm going to leave it in black, equals gamma dt dt minus v over c squared dx dt equals gamma times dt over t, dt is 1 minus v over c squared u of x. And so now finding my equation for transforming velocity, if it's parallel, that is velocity in the x direction, we'll just be taking the, deri or the ratio of those two. Notice the gammas cancel. And, well, I guess it's on the next page where I have the solution. So there's how I add the velocities if they are parallel. Now, any questions at this point? How about if I want to transform, let's say, the y, if I want to find uy prime, how is that going to be the same? How is it going to be different? Okay, the denominator part is going to be the same. What's the numerator part going to be? What? Um, it's one times u of y. That, that is, I mean, you're thinking in the right place. We have dy prime is equal to dy. And so then dy prime divided by dt is dy dt, which is equal to uy. So you're thinking in the right ballpark. So that means that u of y prime is going to be what we just calculated, uy on top and on bottom, gamma times 1 minus v ux over c squared. Notice my gammas don't cancel anymore. I don't have a gamma on the top. I'm done. That is my equation for transforming perpendicular velocities. Now, in a general physics class, they often pretend that the perpendicular velocity stays the same. But you know that can't be true because you would end up with speeds higher than the speed of light if your velocity of light in one direction changes and the other stays the same. <laughs> it wouldn't work out. So this is the actual equations for transforming the velocity parallel and perpendicular. And of course, we don't do a uz prime because that would be exactly the same as uy prime except for you replace the uy. So any questions about the addition of velocities? Okay, everyone that is moving their head is shaking their head and no. So here is what the solutions were. So these are the two that we just worked out. The other two, of course, 
just like before, you just change the direction of V. And so you have the sign change everywhere V occurred. So the reverse transformation is, you know, there's no point in deriving it. It's trivial to derive it. Now something that I showed in class for the general class, and I want to show you why, <laughs> why it's not trivial. So we start with this right here, gamma MV. There's a simplification of gamma MV. Well, I'm going to bring that V inside of my square root. Um, actually, I'm going to do this in multiple steps. Not difficult. Seemingly useless. Now I'm going to divide top and bottom inside the square root by V squared. Why? So I only have one term with a V in it. Okay. Now I need to take that and see what the derivative of that is. V is not a constant now. V is a variable because our integral is over V. So I need to take the derivative of that. So did I do that right? Yeah. So now let's take the derivative of that. Right, so I, I rewrote the 1 over square root as just the argument 1 over v squared minus 1 over c squared. Um, raise the minus 1 half power to make it so it's obvious. Take the derivative, we bring down the power. So I'm going to bring down the minus 1 half. And then we lower the power by 1. And then we multiply it by the derivative of the inside. <laughs> What's the derivative of 1 over v squared? Minus 2v, or no, okay, minus 2 over v cubed. And then I have times dv to finish it out. Didn't quite have enough space there, actually. I can make space. So there's what D gamma MV is. Not what I had written up above. Why? Well, simplification. So if I want to simplify this, I can take this and combine it with this. I'm not actually going to put it in the form that I did before. Well, I can if you want me to, but we have to then take the derivative with respect to V. So it's not all that useful to, to put the gamma cubed in the middle term simply because we're going to have to put it back in terms of V to do the integral. So this is, notice minus one half and minus two multiply out to one. So the minus sides disappear and the twos disappear. And then I have that cubed, or I can bring the V inside. <laughs> 
Actually, I guess I did bring it back into gamma cubed because that is gamma cubed that I have there. The thing in parentheses is gamma. And so now I need to do the integral from a speed of zero to whatever my speed final is of V D that stuff. So a V times M So I need to do that integral. <laughs> How do we do that integral? I actually stopped here this morning. I did it before class um, yesterday. I should have reviewed because that's not an easy integral to do, is it? How would we attack this? Okay, some kind of substitution. We can let I'll put you because is that what you guys use for substitutions as your go-to okay let u equal v squared over c squared therefore du is equal to I'm going to get started on adding a page now just so I don't insert change it to white it still isn't going to work right Insert, now it's going to work. Now it's probably going to crash because that's what happens half the time. So du is equal to, yep, see, look, oh, wait, it started working. 2v over c squared dv. So that allows me to rewrite my integral as... And so I had a V dV, which is going to be, according to what we just did, V dV is equal to C squared over 2 du. Just taking this and solving it for V dV. So that's rewriting my crazy integral. And <laughs> now I realize I'm really, that wasn't the best U to use. Yes, that was the correct U to use. I should have put a one minus, or U is equal to one minus, because that would have made it an easier integral. This is why I should have looked it over this morning. Actually, that was still right, I think, uh, except for my sign. <coughs> okay, so that's what I should have used. Minus... And then this is just u to the one third power. Yeah, <laughs> minus one third. Is that what you're correcting? Yeah. Two thirds? Yes, cred. My brain. Correct. Okay, now we can do this integral because we have u to the minus three halves, the integral of u
You do the minus three halves du. And there's where it crashed. It's somewhat reliable. When you insert a page, it crashes eventually. Yeah, positive things. And so integral of u to the minus 3 halves, you raise the power by 1. So that's u to the minus 1 half. And then you divide by the new power. And then we have to put in our limits. Now I have a minus sign out front a minus underneath, so the minuses disappear. I have divided by two and divided by one half, so the twos disappear. And that's gonna be mc squared times one over u final to the one half power, minus one over u initial to the one half power. And since u was 1 minus v over c, or v squared over c squared, excuse me, then 1 over u to the 1 half power is gamma. So there's the calculation for the change in kinetic energy. As you can see, that was non-trivial. It's certain, certainly not something that we're just going to try to explain in a non tidus based class. It looks real simple when you get to the end, but in between, it was a uh, beguilingly non-simple. Yeah? Were the negatives come out up higher in front of the C squared m over 2? Oh, Where did that initial negative come from? Oh, this one here? That came from our du definition. Since u was 1 minus v squared over c squared, then du had the minus sign. And of course, we would have never gotten to the right answer if you hadn't corrected my problems along the way. Which, I mean, it's sad, but it's true. I'm not infallible. So that's how we get this change in kinetic energy equation. Notice this is just a change equation. It doesn't set what the kinetic energy is. But then we have the requirement that if the speed is zero, what's the kinetic energy going to have to be? Zero. zero. So this sets the kinetic energy plus or, or minus an additive constant. And so if we put, you know, when the speed is zero, it's equal to zero, then that sets the additive constant as minus mc squared. And so from this, we have kinetic energies gamma mc squared plus c, but at v equals zero, gamma equals one, and kinetic energy by definition equals zero. So C plus MC squared equals zero. Therefore, C is minus MC squared. And that's what gives us our equation. Kinetic energy is equal to MC squared times gamma minus one. So I want to make sure we go through that and you see the actual calculus work that brings that in. Right, because it's always, you know, to a physicist at the very least, it's very unfulfilling to just be told, hey, here's an equation. Believe it. It's true. It's been tested. It's a lot better to see that there's a theory that you can follow along that makes it make sense. This all started by saying the net work is equal to change in kinetic energy, right? Change in kinetic energy is equal to the net work, but net work is defined as the integral of force dot dx. It's using stuff that we learned first semester, 
that at this point is trivial compared to what we've learned. And then the, the, the trickiest part, not the hardest part, but the trickiest part was recognizing that by Newton's second law, the net force is dp dt. So we said, let's take the net force is dp dt dot dx, and then shift that dt underneath. Right, that's a, it's a little sly. It's perfectly correct, calculus-wise. But that made it much easier because it was dp dot v that we're integrating. And by definition of momentum, dp dot v is a scalar because v and p are always in the same direction. It's just multiplied out. Any questions about that kinetic energy process, the derivation? All right, then we go to new material. We've just started quantum physics, right? And so we've learned quantum physics is dealing with quantized energies. The origins, the history of quantum physics goes back to things like um, Louis de Broglie. We have learned so far that light was a wave, right? We had Thomas Young's experiment that said light has, it can't be a particle, but it's completely consistent with a wave. And now we have Einstein's photoelectric effect experiment, the experiment you're gonna do in lab today, that shows that light has to, can't be a wave, but it's consistent with the particle. And so that leaves us with a really unhappy situation of saying we have experiments that prove light's not a wave and light, that prove that light's not a particle. So what is light? And physicists have come to a, a compromise where they say, well, really light is both a particle and a wave. And depending on what you're looking at, you have to choose the right one to treat it. So if you're looking at electrons being emitted from a surface because light hit it, you have to look at the light as a particle. And if you're looking at x-rays, you have to look at light as a particle. That's why we had those two things in class yesterday. And I will emphasize that at the beginning of lab today, that those two things we had in class are two of the, the fundamental four things we talk about in class where light is behaving as a particle. And when we talk about interference, interference can't happen with particles. It can only happen with waves. So then we have to look at light as a wave. Well, then Erwin Schrodinger said, well, no, I got to go back to Louis de Broglie. Louis de Broglie said, well, you know, this, this was part of his, you know, small little thesis. His thesis was something like 50 pages or less. Oh, for the day, he could get away with that. Actually, in mathematics, he still can. Um, but in his thesis, he said something to the effect of, you know, if light can be both a wave or a particle, then shouldn't other particles also be able to be treated as waves? They have a dual nature, both wave and particle. And de Broglie hypothesized the wavelength for a particle should be equal to Planck's constant divided by its momentum. And so then Erwin Schrodinger said, well, if, if we have particles that behave as waves, then we should be able to make a wave equation for the particles, just like we made a wave equation for light, a wave equation for wave on a string. Remember, we did both of those things in class. So he said there should be a wave equation that we can make for a particle to look at its wave nature. And of course, what do you think his colleague said to that? Kind of. He said, oh yeah, then what is it, Mr. Smarty Pants? And so he went off and he spent some time and he came back with this wave equation. Now this wave equation is different than the wave equation that you've seen for light. He derived it using Hamiltonian dynamics. That is, using a principle of variations. Remember, we did that Rakistochrome problem, and it was a, a variational method. This is a method of variations based on energy that Schrodinger developed. And so he came to this equation. He says, we're going to call the capital letter psi. So that thing that looks kind of like a trident, that's the capital psi. We're going to call that the wave function for the particle. And the wave equation is the equation you use to find the wave function. 
And so this equation has what we call operators. Operators are functions that act on a function. And so here we have an operator, i h bar d d t. That's an operator. And when you have that operate on the wave function, which is a function of position and time, it gives you the energy multiplied by that same wave function. So that function that I just showed, and actually I should have used colors to differentiate it. I'll just change color and rewrite it. That thing in green, we call the energy operator. Because it's a function that when we apply it to the wave function, it gives us an important value. So we call this here, that's the energy value. And now you look at this and you start to say, okay, first of all, there's a symbol in there I don't recognize. Second of all, it looks like some crazy voodoo. So first, what's the symbol that you don't recognize? Okay, there's an H with a bar through it. Oddly enough, we call it H bar. And what does that mean? Well, we know that H is Planck's constant. H bar, when I was in college, my teacher called it H slant, and so forever, it took me a long time to learn to say H bar, you hear it both ways, is defined as H over 2 pi. That's all it is. Some people call it Planck's reduced constant. I've seen other names for it as well. Some people just call it Planck's constant and really confuse the issue. So we usually say something like H bar or H slant. And then everybody knows what we mean is Planck's constant H over 2 pi. So that's the, the unknown symbol. Why do we have that? It turns out it's extremely useful. It shows up all the time. Um, it has units of angular momentum. The angular momentum for things like, you know, electron are one half of that, um, one half of that in one of two directions. Um, so it shows up all over the place. So that's our energy operator, that I h bar d d t. So what is that psi then? I said it's the wave function. The wave function is the function that contains all of the information about the particle. All you have to do is get that wave function, and then you put the right operator on it, and you'll find whatever you want, which is pretty miraculous. So that's like all of the information. Now, can we put this into something that makes more sense to help guide our thinking? Of course. We better be able to, or else I wouldn't bring it up, right? Because then I'd just be <laughs> no tough luck to you. Um, a hologram. What is a hologram? You've all seen them, right? What does it look like? A three D light projection. Yeah, we have a three D light projection. But how do you how do you make a hologram? That's not how do you put together things to actually make it on film. But how is a hologram taken from film so you can view it. Not, not sure? It's a combination of reflection and something else. Okay, there are two kinds, and one has reflection and one doesn't. So, yes, it can be. Basically, the simple one, the one that I want to talk about, you shine an expanded laser beam through film, and then when you look at it from the other side, you'll see your hologram, which is a three-dimensional image. So you can move around and it, you know, you see it from different aspects. So one of the things I find really cool is um, when I was in high school, my teacher had a hologram of a telephone, the old, I say old, it was new back then, 
a touch tone telephone, right? Because we had rotary phones. <laughs> but a touch tone telephone with a magnifying glass sitting in front of it. And as you move around, you could see different parts of the telephone magnified by looking through the magnifying glass. And so, I mean, it's just, you're like, how does that work? That's some crazy kind of magic to be able to see, okay, now the, you know, the one button is magnified, move over, you know, now the five button is magnified and one button's not. That film somehow contained all of the information about that image. That film is an analog, really, to what's going on with our wave function, containing all of the information. What that film actually is, is a complicated diffraction pattern. And so you shine light through, and it creates a diffraction pattern that creates you know, places of constructive interference, and you look and you see things there. How you actually make it, then, is you have light, let's say I want to make a hologram of, of Gila. I would have like one laser beam that goes from my laser over to my film. But I split it off and have a separate, I split it off so it would be coherent, have a fixed phase relationship. Comes over and reflects off of Gila goes to the film. So because I had a fixed phase relationship between the light that was going straight to the film and the light going to Gila, I will have a consistent interference pattern that's made on the film. And the simple hologram we get to talk about, we call a volume hologram, you actually are making a three-dimensional diffraction pattern. Because, of course, the diffraction pattern is going to be different if you're here compared to here. Because the angles are you know, constant. And so it's that three-dimensional diffraction pattern that then we use to reconstruct so the wave function is carrying information just like the hologram is. So back to this, so far I've only looked at this side of the equal sign. What's the other side? So the left side is gonna be, when you put the operator on there, it's gonna be the energy times the wave function equals to this stuff. Well, what is the total energy equal to? Basic question going back to like, fourth week of first semester. Yeah, kinetic energy plus potential energy. And so the next term there is the kinetic energy equation. So we have the kinetic energy operator is that minus h bar squared over 2m d second dx squared. Now, what is the equation for kinetic energy in terms of momentum? Um, no, simpler. <laughs> we know that kinetic energy, P squared over 2M, and so that means if I take this operator, my kinetic energy operator should be the momentum operator squared over 2M. Well, we can immediately see where this 2M comes from, and what's left must be my momentum operator squared. And so that means that if my kinetic energy, and we put like this to say it's the operator, we put a hat over it. So now it's, now it's not, a, not a unit vector, it's an operator. It's equal to minus h bar squared over 2m d second dx squared. And that's going to be equal to my momentum operator squared over 2m. Then that means my momentum operator squared is equal to minus h bar squared d second dx squared. Well, if you take the square root of that, what's the square root of minus one? Yeah, we have i. And, and of course, technically it's plus or minus i. And so we have our momentum operator, it turns out, is equal to i, and actually it's that's to within a plus or minus. And it, it, it turns out that I believe it's h bar over i or minus i h bar d dx. But from working backward, you can't tell if it's the plus or the minus sense. So that's what this term means. You, we can see meaning to this equation. 
the reason I'm going through this meaning, I'll tell you, when I took this class, when I took quantum mechanics, the teacher explained it this way, but I want the equation to make more sense instead of just be some random voodoo thing. You want to see down here? Okay. Then the last term, you can't see now because I scrolled for, for Brady, is plus V psi. V is your potential energy function. So that is your Schrodinger equation. That's the equation that we use to find the wave function psi. So we take that equation, we solve it, and we find what psi is. And right now you're going to say, that sounds incredibly random. At least to me it did. And so we'll do an example, and we won't get very far into the example today, of finding the wave function for a particle in a box. So first of all, what is a particle? Of, um, oh, I have to go through this first. We only use this equation as shown after we've learned a lot in quantum mechanics. So we're not going to use this equation. We're going to take this equation and take a condition. Yeah, we, we've, we've seen everything that's on this, except for the time-dependent wave function if we don't have the potential dependent of time, so if V is not a function of time, that's usually the case, right? Gravitation potential only depends on elevation, not on time. Electric potential only depends on charges and separations, not on time. As long as the potential is not a function of time, then we can write our, our wave func function as a product of one that's respect to time and one that's a function of of position and doing that plugging that in we can find two completely separable equations one that is only in time and one that is only in position so notice it changed from a partial derivative to an exact derivative in the upper one that's because now x is the only variable so the difference in a partial and a, and a um, Exact, there is no difference. So that's why it's changed to an exact. So this equation here is the only one that we're going to use here, and that's the time-independent Schrodinger equation. It's taking the full Schrodinger equation and separating it into a time part and a time-independent part, a spatial part. So that's the only one we're going to look at. Now, to the particle in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The solution to this is very simple. You have a sinusoidal shift. Um, what would you do to solve this differential equation? You've done it like at least 10 times in this class. Separate the variables and integrate. So I have to divide both sides by V, multiply both sides by dt, and integrate. And the solution I get is that phi is equal to e to the minus i e t over h bar. And using Euler's formula, you can put that in as, as a sinusoidal relationship. So that's where the cosine and sine come in. Now the wave function can be imaginary. The information we find from it, things like what's the energy What's the momentum? Those have to be real. But the wave function can be imaginary because it's carrying a lot of information and some of it will be in that part. Okay. <laughs> the solutions for the, the time independent part we call stationary states because they're not dependent on time. They're constant states. So when we talk about the energy levels of an atom those are stationary states. The energy levels aren't changing in time. Okay, this is the slide that I want to get to before we end. It just sets the tone for what we're going to do in class next week. The infinite square well, or the particle in a box. It's not something real, but it's something real-ish. What does it mean to have a particle in a box? It means you have a particle that has some reasonable potential energy for a range 
and then an infinite potential energy on either side of that. Now, if we just talked about a box, or excuse me, a box, a BB in a box. If I put a BB in a box, and the box has infinitely tall walls, that would be infinite gravitational potential energy, right? To get over them. If I put the BB in the box, and I shake the box around, is the BB going to come out? No, it can't. Why not? Yeah, it never have enough energy to get over the wall. Now, one of the funny things we learn in quantum physics is if that wall is a thin wall, quantum physics says it can get out. Even though it doesn't have enough energy to go over the top, it can do what we call tunneling and just appear outside the box when it was inside the box. But if we have the walls extend for infinity, then it can't get out. And so this problem has taken away that option as well. It's just stuck in the box. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find solutions to this time-independent Schrodinger equation inside the box and outside the box to find properties about the particle in the box. So that's what we will do a week from today.